All right, I'm going to get started. I'm uh, Michelle Reardon Old. I'm the executive director of the Connecticut Data Collaborative. <laughs> Hi, David. <laughs> So we saved the best for last. <laughs> no, this is, um, so uh, what I'm gonna do today is I'm gonna talk, we are the um, Census State Data Center. Um, CT Data is the designated Census State Data Center. So an important piece of our work is um, making census data accessible to the public and connecting um, all of you to Census Bureau products and um, census um, resources. So I wanted to take this opportunity to talk about all the changes that are happening with census data. You have heard about some of them, um, and many of you may know about them, but I figured redundancy is okay, especially when we're talking about data. It helps it stick, right? So um, today um, we're going to finish off with talking about county equivalents. Not sure if you all know about that. Differential privacy, race and ethnicity, population estimates. So all the good stuff, right, was saved for the end. <laughs> um, so, um, so some of these um, changes that are happening may increase data gaps, um, and some will impact accuracy census data. So as data users, it's really um, important to um, understand what's going on with our census data. So for those of you who don't know, planning regions are now the new counties in census data. So what does that mean? Um, so county equivalence is a term that the Census Bureau uses, um, and we are now going to be calling um, our county equivalents our planning regions. So instead of, um, I can see the state chief data officer smiling back there. Um, this is near and dear to his heart. <laughs> um, so uh, planning regions, our council of governments, as some of you may know them. So what will happen is the Census Bureau is no longer going to be producing data at the county level. Um, so these changes have been reflected in the population estimates that were released in March. And if you want to learn more about that, you can go visit our blog. We have a blog post on the population estimates at the um, planning region level. And then if you use data.census.gov to access census data, you'll want to look under county equivalents if you're looking for regional data. So. Um, what does this mean? So what are the good things about this? Well, it enables the planning region council of governments um, to apply for federal grants. So in 1960, county government was abolished. Um, so now that um, by allowing this change, now planning regions will have the data to then be able to use that data to apply for federal grants. So it also helps for planning regions to be able to um, plan and um, allocate resources. So what, some of the cons is that we won't be able to um, compare data over time. So you won't be able to obviously compare old county data to new planning region data. Um, and then of course there are some administrative and implementation and reporting challenges that it brings about. So if you go on and look at our blog, you can see these are the new planning regions in white, which is kind of hard to see. Those are the old county boundaries. Um, but we also have a crosswalk on our website from towns to planning regions for those of you who want to aggregate town level data to pla uh, planning regions. So just a couple of um, what this means and doesn't mean. So an example, um, the Department of Public Health will begin issuing public health indicators at the planning region level, not counties. So. Um, for example, vaccina vaccination rates will be at planning regions as opposed to counties. Um, longitudinal data will have to be crosswalked to the eight counties if possible, right? That's only if town level data is available and you can aggregate it up. Um, if, if no town level data exists, then you won't be able to compare longitudinally. What it doesn't mean is that we are not returning to county governments, governance. So we did get that question one time pr when presenting to mun municipalities. So the next big change is around data privacy. So a new method has been applied to um, Census 2020 data. So the Census Bureau is trying to balance privacy with usefulness of the data. And so the method they're using is um, called differential privacy. And like I said, it's a way to protect and prevent people from being able to identify individuals within the data. Um, the Census Bureau, with 
you know, more data out in the public, um, more, you know, um, you know, just plethora of data, the fear is that you could use and triangulate with many of the sources that are available and be able to identify people in census data. So what they do is they apply statistical noise um, and includes random additions and subtractions um, into the data to reduce the risk that someone could be re-identified. Um, and it forms the foundation of the disclosure avoidance system. What they also do then is the Census Bureau has a post-processing um, step and it's after they add the noise, there's additional changes made to make sure that so for, um, state totals stay the same. So we will always have 3.6 million people in Connecticut, um, depending, you know, whichever um, geographic level of data you're using, it will roll up to 3.6 million people. So after they add the noise and make changes and subtractions, they have to make sure that if you aggregate the data, it shows 3.6 million people. And then they also need to make sure when they're doing additions and subtractions, if negative counts show up, you can't have negative people, you can't have negative housing units. So they have to make sure that that stays, um, they turn, you know, make sure that there's no negative counts. So there's a lot of discussion in the, in the data census community around this post-processing, because this is where a lot of error is getting um, added. So, um, so some things that won't change. So like a, the total number of people in the state, like I said, will not change. The total number of housing units in a, in a census block won't change. And the number of occupied group quarters facilities won't change. So those are what the Census Bureau calls invariant, meaning they don't change with differential privacy um, being added. So the, there's no noise in that data. But then everything else will have noise. So, um, you know, if you're looking at population counts in group quarters, those will have some noise added in. Um, so, so it complicates things. So the implications for us. So in Connecticut, right, often many of us are looking at town level data. So the way Census Bureau um, handles geographies is they have what they call um, on the spine. And this is on the spine geographies. So we have nations, we have regions, divisions, states, counties, census tracts, block groups, and blocks. That's the lowest level of geography. And so what happens here is blocks they nest up to block groups, block groups nest up to census tracts, counties. And so what, um, um, what they've done is that if you're on, um, but our, our towns are considered county subdivisions, and so we're off-spine. So these off-spine geographies are not part of the disclosure avoidance process, so they're not part of dif differential privacy. So as a consequence, um, the noise-infused data for these areas may be um, noisier than if you're on the spine. So um, their margins of errors are going to be potentially larger than if you were on the spine. So um, we are all, we as, uh, you know, CT data, I mean, still don't know the implications for all of this. Um, the um, DHC data file has not been released yet which is forthcoming at the end, end of this month. Um, and so that's when we'll start to see housing characteristics data, demographic and housing characteristics data. That's what that stands for. And so we're, we'll be trying to understand the implications of what this means, um, especially because we do use an off-spine geography for a lot of the work we do. Um, but even more reason to consider, if you can, regional data, which is planning region data now just to avoid the large margins of error that could be potentially in our data. So finally, we did hear about this earlier, the race, ethnicity, data collection, and coding challenges. Um, so I'm, not, I'm gonna kind of go through this quickly, assuming that you all were here for the lunch plenary. Um, but the purpose you know, of the Census Bureau was to capture, of their changes to race, ethnicity, was to better capture the increasing diversity in racial ethnic identities. As we heard earlier, you know, there was a large increase in two or more races. Um, and we have a blog post as well that dives into the um, 
Connecticut data. So I know we heard about all the Massachusetts data and largely what he was presenting about the Bo well, Boston data is very true for Connecticut data as well. So the largest changes um, in racial classification of residents who identify as Hispanic or Latino. Um, you can see the drop in white alone and the increase in two or more races. And what we don't know is that, you know, is it really due to population change? Or it's due to the recoding of some other race, right? So we see, we see these trends in Connecticut data as well. And when you look at, you know, residents who don't identify um, as Hispanic or Latino, you have the uh, more than doubling of the two or more races. Um, and again, it's due to coding, and we don't, don't know quite yet what is due to population increases versus their coding changes. So you can see, oh, now you can see it, um, <laughs> the numbers I'm talking about there. Um, so yeah, I encourage you to, um, we have a really great blog post with lots of detail if you're interested in learning more about um, seeing the Connecticut data. So what are the implications of all these changes? You know, and again, I, I'm, I'm repeating the, the, the lunch plenary, um, but you know, overall, more people are coded as two or more races, um, and the impact is larger on the Hispanic and Latino population. Um, longitudinal comparisons, you won't be able to compare race data over time. Um, Hispanic and non-Hispanic data, though, can be compared over time. And the good news is, and as Natalie Evan Harris uh, mentioned, they have the RFC out for race ethnicity changes and encourage everybody to respond to it and provide your, your thoughts on their changes um, because they are looking to revise their collection methodologies. Uh, we did, CT Data did host a listening session um, in February with the Census Bureau to provide feedback and we had Several, I saw several people in the room who did, were participating in that listening session and gave great feedback. Um, so thank you for your participation. But I encourage you all to reach out to the Census Bureau and provide feedback. So what's um, upcoming with our work on census data as well? So who in the room has used decennial census data? Keep your hands raised. So who has used ACS? data. Now tell me who has used population estimates. <laughs> yeah, so um, let me tell you a little bit about population estimates and why they're so important. And I suspected that was the case. Um, but uh, so right now um, we're in post sensual population estimates. Um, so that's post sensual population estimates are developed after the decennial census. Um, and they're the basis for all per capita funding allocations. So they're really important. Um, and they're used for economic development and regional planning. They serve as denominators for population-based rates. So example, COVID vaccination rates are using population estimates as the denominator and other epidemiological rates as well. So um, really important data um, and they, um, are created, they're um, built off of the decennial census. They provide annual population changes. So they take the population base, they add in births, subtract deaths, add in net migration, and then you get the population. And these are done on an annual basis. So what are we doing um, and why am I mentioning it? So what's um, really important is the Census Bureau doesn't release town level population estimates by age, sex, race, and Hispanic origin. However, if you want to know the COVID vaccination rate for, say, um, black people in Hartford, um, you need to have a good denominator, right? And that is something that we are missing. So we're working with the Department of Public Health um, to develop a model that's sustainable for the future for town level um, ASRH um, estimates. Um, educating folks on the importance of population estimates and in particular the role of municipalities. So there are surveys that the Census Bureau sends out that impact the population estimates and so we need to make sure that um, those surveys are filled out and then can therefore feed into our estimates and feed into federal funding. So um, we're also working on reviewing 
um, and evaluating the, access, um, the accuracy of the decennial census right now, particularly group quarters. Um, so, because it's the end of the day, oh, I think I skipped over. Uh, lots of, yes, so those are, those are all the changes I wanted to talk about um, briefly. We will have lots of information on um, our website um, as, as you know, data gets released by the Census Bureau and we are able to look at it and um, analyze it um, and figure out the impl implications of these changes. Uh, I mean, we all know that census data was challenged by COVID and then there was um, political interference, um, which made, you know, folks nervous about um, the 2020 decennial census. And then you add in differential privacy and race ethnicity changes. And so there's a lot there to unpack when we're um, analyzing the data and looking at it. So, like I said, we'll have lots more information um, and there's lots of opportunities um, to attend an upcoming event, um, events, information, webinars. You can read our blog posts, um, subscribe to the newsletter so you can know when we put out um, information. And then with that, I just want to, you know, thank everybody. Thank you to our sponsors. Um, we couldn't have made this event possible without their support. Thank you to my fabulous team at CT Data who did so much work to put this together. Um, and as a um, token of appreciation for all of you staying, we're going to have a raffle. Um, but before that, I want all of you to um, scan the QR code and fill out the survey because we love data, but we really do use the data that we um, collect from the survey to provide input for future conferences. So, um, so I love, while you're all filling out the survey, I'll just have reflections on the day. <laughs> um, so I, I've enjoyed having um, you all come together. This is amazing to see this many people at the end of the event. We never have a packed room at the end of the day, um, hence the raffle. Um, so <laughs> I guess it worked. You can, I don't know if that's a survey question or not, but we can <laughs> see. No, I think it's really a testament to the, the speakers and the panelists and um, to my staff's um, hard work and putting and designing this um, day that speaks and, and all of you in the interest and in, um, coming out here. So it, I love to see the gathering and the talking and the, the new partnerships. And Natalie Evans-Harris mentioned in the morning, you know, data is um, without context is dangerous. And I think you all provide, you know, to CT data the context that we're missing when we're just, you know, diving into the Census Bureau data and, you know, looking at the numbers. So um, I really appreciate all of you participating and there's a call to action for all of us here as data users um, to improve our engagement with data um, by understanding the intersection with community. Just a few themes I heard. Um, inequitable data collection has left people of color out of the story. Data is a bridge, not a solution. Stay focused on the questions that we want to know. Be accountable to who is counted. And data controls the kinds of questions you can answer. But I, I look forward to hearing what you all learned today at the happy hour after this. <laughs> so um, with that, can we just you know, give a big thank you to the CT Data team, our panelists, and our sponsors, and to all of you for participating and making it a great day. <laughs>